Hey church, welcome back to weekly services. It's our desire that once a week you get an opportunity to kind of sit and soak in the wonderful good news about Jesus, his forgiveness and his love. Hey, don't forget every day there are guided prayers made available to help you in whatever you might be facing on a given day. And I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you so much for your generosity. There is absolutely no obligation but uh, out of gratitude, enjoy people all over the world, give freely of their resource and finance. And of course, in scripture, giving and generosity is a pretty large, massive, overwhelming theme, such as John 3, 16, maybe the most famous verse in all the Bible, God so loved the world, he gave. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Generosity has changed the world. Generosity has changed your life and mine, whether we're aware of it or not. I wanna thank you for responding to the generosity of God with our own expression of generosity, which oftentimes is time, effort, attention, and also resource and money. I wanna thank so many of you from all over the world. We pool our resources together here at Church Home and it makes guided prayers. Uh, it makes weekly service, monthly, it makes all of it actually possible. So thank you for your generosity. Uh, there's a spot where you can give. I think there's a text number and giving hands and all kinds of things. And I'm sure you uh, will find that. And lastly, uh, you probably already know this, but uh, hitting the subscribe button below here on our YouTube channel actually literally helps us serve you better. There's constantly new content that we're producing and preparing to help you in your spiritual journey. This certainly helps us get that content to you more efficiently and effectively. Now, without any further ado, we're gonna go right into a sermon, a message that I pray is news that is super good, encouraging, and maybe even gives you some energy and strength as you go through your daily life and even the week ahead. Head. So here is weekly service here at Church Home. Thanks, Church. The title of, of, of my talk tonight, and I'm really excited about it, is uh, how to start following Jesus again. How to start following Jesus all over again. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that. But, but here's the premise I'm going to be working from. If you and I went to coffee and you asked me, how do I start following Jesus? Let's say for a moment, and no doubt there's people in this room who maybe aren't following Jesus, are really unsure with where to place or put Jesus or how to believe in Jesus, or is Jesus uh, a real person? Is he a mythical person? Is he just a uh, kind of a prophet of the ages of old that we should kind of respect and just kind of be knowledgeable of? Who is Jesus? And let's say we get to coffee and for some reason, you feel compelled to like, I'd, I'd actually like to follow in the way of Jesus, this sermon is dedicated to what I would say at that coffee shop for two hours. All right, relax. But this is dedicated to how I would respond to that. Now, for those of you that already follow Jesus, this message is equally as important because I'd like to propose to you, and we're gonna read an opening verse of scripture that proves that in fact this is true, that you can start all over again following Jesus. The term Christian is an interesting term. It's a term that we were given, those of us that follow the ways of Jesus and worship Jesus as who he claimed to be, which was not merely a prophet or a miracle worker or a healer, but Jesus, of course, claimed to be God in the physical form, God in flesh. For those of us that have accepted that and believe that Jesus is that, at one point in an effort to criticize us, they called us like little Jesuses walking around. This, of course, is an ancient time before you and I were even a thought. But the early followers of the way of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus were called in a derogatory way, little Jesuses, little Christ, i.e. Christians. Now, today, when you tell someone you're a Christian, I'm not saying you should be ashamed of that. I'm not saying that you can't use that term, but that term is loaded, if you don't mind me saying it's just loaded, okay? Whether you want it to be loaded, whether you don't think it's loaded. By the way, if you don't think it's loaded, you need to get out more. Okay, because it don't matter where I am recently. I was on one of them subway buses in an airport, in SeaTac Airport, and somebody's like, hey, are you? And it was yeah, a Christian pastor, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what I want to say is I'm a preacher who's 
trying to just follow the way of Jesus because Christian now has been parlayed and colluded by our culture. And you, you almost are almost instantly put into a category in a box the moment you say Christian. So why do I say that? What if we could start all over again? What if we could rethink this whole thing? So here is my agenda tonight. Oh, another preacher with, a, with an agenda. Here's my agenda to bring you and I to a place in the next few minutes of, how should I say, freshness, newness, a perspective of what if I could start all over again? Now, here's the truth. There are people in this room tonight, you would do just about anything to start over again. Now, you get to my age and there's a lot of things you do over again, okay? That's just the way it is. A lot of things you do over. My dog, dug into the garbage yesterday or two days ago or three days ago. And he got just garbage all over my nice cream couch. And I yelled at that little dog, okay? And I, yelling is very easy for me. It's not hard. Some of you like yelling takes a lot of effort. It's actually almost effortless for me yelling. Ah! You know, it's just, it comes out very natural. It's like my natural habitat. So I yelled at that dog. And if you've ever had a dog who loves you unconditionally and you yell at your dog, that dog assumes a position it is devastating, right? He just starts to arch his back and he starts to, and then he like, he, he meandered to the stairs and slowly went up the stairs. I'm like, yeah, go upstairs, disobedient little guy. And then like 10 minutes goes by, the passion and zeal is gone and all that I'm left with is regret and remorse because I have an anger problem that I took out on my harmless little itty bitty multi-poo teacup. His name's Louis Merle. His middle name's Merle, named after a horse that I did equine therapy with, and the horse changed my life, so I named my dog Louis Merle. You're like, Judah, that's the seventh time you have told us that, and we're over it. Yeah, but you brought a friend, and your friend didn't know that, so I wanted to share that. <laughs> but we'd all like to do, have some do-overs in life, right? Ah, I wish I hadn't said that. Wish I wouldn't have done that. If you're married in this room and you have no regrets, you are the second coming of the Christ. For the rest of us, marriage is laden with regrets. Words I didn't want to say, but they came out and I said them. And then you're like, I wish I could take them back. I want to introduce you to a portion of scripture that by uh, mere observation, it sounds somewhat negative. Isaiah chapter 40, and I think it's verse eight, says this about light. How's this for an opening verse to start the night? The grass withers, the flower fades, but what God says goes on and on and on. I think we get the ESV. The grass withers, the flower fades, but what God says never ends. It goes on and on and on, which is another way of saying not only what God says, but God is always speaking and it goes on and on. Now, this scripture, how many of you have ever heard this scripture before? Just some, some church folks in a row. Oh, impressive. Excuse me. <laughs> Hands went up all over the place. A lot more people have heard this verse than have children at our church here. That's fine. Okay, but this verse, oftentimes in this context, for those that don't know, is kind of used in this tone. The grass withers and the flower fades but God's word will stand forever. And we all go, amen, 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 amen. And it's used kind of to highlight the impotence, the, the power, the dominance, the, the leadership of God. But I want to draw your attention to natural seasons that are alluded to. The grass withers, but I got good news. One grass withers and new grass grows. The flower fades. I just got flowers at our local farmer's market. I don't want to brag. Fresh flowers. And I, I literally, by the way, this is, I don't know why I'm, I say some of these things. I, I dreamed of the day where I would have enough resource in my life where I could buy fresh flowers every week. Not a big amount of flowers. Everybody relax. You're looking at me like, whoa, must be nice. Wealthy preacher. All right, shut up. But it's so exciting to get fresh flowers. Fresh flowers do for me what very few people could ever do for me. I'm kidding. Come on, everybody relax. But, but, Already today, we got like orange flowers because it's almost October and October is like, it's orange month, you know? It's just like, I just love the orange and the fall and the autumn colors and the leaves are changing. And I used to listen to old people like me talk like this and thought I would never do that, but here I am and I am that man and I am my father, okay? I'm obsessed with leaves and birds and grass, and, but the flowers are already kind of angling down. 
gravity has its way with all things, right? And the flowers are already, but guess what? Saturday, the farmer's market's coming back to town and I can get some more flowers. I think a lot of what this verse is telling us about the nature of our existence on earth is that seasons come and seasons go and they come again. A day ends and a new day begins. Chapters close and chapters open. Doors close and doors open. So if you're here tonight and you are finding yourself feeling that you're in the dark of night, that you're at the close of a chapter, you're at the end of a season, you're at the end of an era, and there seems to be a little bit of regret or maybe just a little bit sense of the brevity and fragility of life, which at my age is sobering. And I don't mean sobering in the best way. I mean, just kind of saddening. Maybe you're going through one of those chapters where you're like, wow, more loss. Wow, more closure. I gotta let this go. This has come and this is gone. Now, what am I gonna do? Well, 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 I got good news because when a chapter closes, God always starts another one. In fact, I'll take it a step further. Even when you die, um, you know the chapter that starts? It's the eternal one. So congrats on that. An eternal chapter, that means forever. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth and there will we, we, we will be home and we will be together. And I'm, I'm sure at some point in this next year, I'm gonna do an extended treatment on eternity and on heaven and new heavens and a new earth because I think that anyone even considering the divine and considering a relationship with the divine should consider home because this is not it. Don't get it twisted. This is not the original plan. You drive the streets of this wonderful city and the people in it of whom I am in love with. And don't get me started because I will start crying and I am only 10 minutes into this sermon and that is not appropriate because you know I don't cry until like the 50th minute. Okay, but I love this city, but you drive through this city and you know it wasn't supposed to be totally like this. The disparity, the disregard we have for each other at times, how we rank the importance of humans, how we say some humans are more important than others. And sometimes we do this subconsciously in our brokenness. So please don't sit there and go, I never do that. Yeah, you do. Just relax. We all do. And it's embarrassing to admit it. And we treat some people as if they have more value than other people, when in reality, nothing could be more eternally untrue. But here we are in a planet that is plagued in a planet where, frankly, I don't know about you, but I read Isaiah 40 and my knee-jerk reaction is to think about withering and fading. And that, we could just kind of sit there tonight and be like, wow, this is really encouraging. What's the title of your message? How not to wither and fade. Oh, but do you notice everything does? Things fade, things rust, things are degenerating. Gravity is working, right? It's everywhere we look, but, but let's not also forget, let's not forget that God also brings new life, opens new chapters, opens new doors, grants you new chapters in new seasons. Chapters change, seasons come and they go. I think a sitcom stars all the time. I don't know about you, but I grew up dreaming about being a sitcom star, right? I didn't know if it was gonna be a Bayside High School. I didn't know where it was gonna be in Bel Air, like, but I wanted to be a sitcom star. But it is um, um, amazing that sitcoms come and they go, fads come and they go, chapters come and they go. And, and I, I'd like to introduce you to some content tonight that I think will see you through when the grass withers or when the grass grows new. That this, these are elements and dynamics of following Jesus that I think can give you a level of vibrance, a level of buoyancy that will see you through the valleys and the mountains and then the really average days, which are neither low nor high, they're average. We don't talk a lot about those. That doesn't make a lot of good for good preaching. Preachers are famous for valley sermons and mountaintop sermons. But we're not always famous for like, oh, flat sermons. <laughs> Just prepare you for the flat everyday life. But, but I think that if you and I could go to coffee for a few minutes, I could share with you some of my discoveries 
And I think maybe you could see Isaiah 40 as there's some withering, and there's some fading in my life, but there's also some, some regrowth and some rebirth, like some fresh flowers from the farmer's market. There's a new scent. There's a new color. There's a new vibrance to my life. And I'm hoping that in the next few minutes that you could leave here, maybe with a fresh skip in your step, maybe with a sense that, that God is good and he is preparing good things just around the corner for you. I believe that. Marriage is hard. Did I mention that? How many of you are married just out of sheer curiosity? How many of you wish you weren't married? I mean, I mean that's, the, that's the dumbest. Oh, you know, guy just went, yeah, that's me. How many of you are not married? Watch this. What, what's the joke? What comes next? Look around. All right, all right. This is old joke's all pastors use. Um, well, since most of you are not married, let me fill you in. Marriage is hard. Um, and anyone who calls themselves a marriage expert couldn't be less of one. Same with parenting. If you ever meet a parent who's an expert, run screaming the other direction. And here's why. Since when, and how did this happen, that we became experts in evolving, changing humans? There's no such thing. I'm sorry, there's no such thing. That's like saying you're an expert on God. <laughs> Who never changes, but he's inexhaustible. And the content of his character fills forever. So what I mean is that moment after moment, though there are none in eternity, we will be overcome with a new dimension and aspect of who God is. Furthermore, humans down here, working with humans, they're always changing, always evolving. The world is growing. The world is changing. Technology is changing. Information, data, our brains, our priorities, our aspirations, our pleasures, our pains, our difficulties, it's changing. I look at my kids and I go, you are heroic and I have no idea how you're in high school in 2023 because that would be hard. That would be hard. In my, I had a pager in high school. It was sick. And it buzzed a lot because my mom is very engaged. <laughs> That's a true story. Is that your pager again? Yeah, 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 bro, don't worry about it. That's, I did it all the time. People be like, whoa, you just got the sickest pager. It's always buzzing with my mom, bro. Call me. All right, mom, leave me alone. It was different. Today, and in a moment, we're going to get into some content that um, will, I hope, be invigorating, but no doubt it will be challenging. In a moment, we're going to discuss about how to live just the day. That's hard to do because that's not how the culture is oriented anymore. We, we, we don't celebrate an ordinary Tuesday. That's not how it works anymore. In fact, if you have an ordinary Tuesday, for God's sake, don't tell anyone. If you have a meal that's not gorgeous and Instagrammable, don't tell anyone. If you don't have the sickest ride and the coolest fit and the, well, don't fake it. Fake it. It's a weird time. At Burbank, they, they sell time in a fake jet airplane. And people can, they rent it out 15 minutes at a time. Do you know that in Burbank? It's a fake private jet. And and some of you have rented it out. You know, I say that, you know, but sorry, I just occurred to me, I can see that on your face. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Dang it. <laughs> what? 16 year olds are faking like they're on a jet airplane? I don't know. That, is, that was the furthest thing from what I was thinking about at 16. Let me tell you. Right, but the, the era has changed. I'm not saying one's worse or one's better. I'm just saying it's, it's different. New chapters, new seasons, new eras. You're an expert? Well, then clearly you're not. Because the smartest people I know are the people that go, but I'm not really sure. The best marriages I've seen is where each spouse is like, this is hard. And every day seems to be brand new. And it's not because one spouse is so undependable or the other person. It's just there's so many elements and so many dynamics that are impacting us on a daily basis. I used to ask 
you know, as a youth pastor, I used to visit students on campus and, hey, how you feeling? And I knew what the answer was going to be. Yeah, good. Good. I spent 10 years, an entire decade, visiting high school and college campuses almost every day. All the time. I'd show up, made friends with principals, whatever you can imagine. It was a different era. I would literally, I wouldn't check into the office. I'd just walk in, make nice with the janitors and the custodians and the, and, and the faculty. Hey, hey, Judy again. Hey, how are you guys? I'm, I mean, now you, you, I, I can't get into a high school to see my daughter play volleyball without go, going through a security check. Of course, it's just that the, the, the time has, has changed, but I would meet with high schoolers all the time. And we, we didn't have lengthy conversations about deep, deep stress and anxiety. We didn't, there wasn't, uh, there was uh, gossip. Uh, they didn't make the team. Uh, there was a girl, there was a guy, there was that. But, but now you, you engage with high school students and college students and they are, in some cases, overcome with a sense of fear of the future and anxiety. And you meet 16-year-olds who are scared about will they have income when they're 35. And I'm thinking, I didn't even think in terms of 35 when I was 16. I, it was just a different day. So here we are. What if we could start over again? What if we could start brand new? What if we were sitting somewhere in a cafe and I got to tell you, here's how I think you should start following Jesus. Let me just say what I wouldn't say, because that will be provocative and fun. Are you ready? By the way, as sure as there are no experts in parenting and marriage, there are also no experts in God. And if you think I'm an expert, you have quite literally not figured me out at all. I know less about God today than I have ever known in my life, but I have never felt his love the way I feel today. That's a fact. He is bigger and more mysterious to me than he's ever been. And yet his love is more tangible and present than it's ever been. And I got to tell you, it is just exhilarating. I have broken so many rules that all my, my dad was a pastor, his dad was a pastor, his dad was a pastor. His, there were so many rules for preachers and I've broken a lot of those rules and I have found that I have fallen more and more and more in love with Jesus. What if we could start all over again? Here's what I'm not going to say. I'm not going to start with, you need to go home, read your Bible and pray. That's not what we're going to start with. I am very, very concerned. When we introduce people to the way of Jesus, we almost instinctively tell them what to do. And that's the problem. I'd like to propose to you that if you started over with Jesus, if you started again, if you believe in the, in the budding of new flowers and new grass and new beginnings and new chapters and new eras and new open doors, and if you could start all over again, I would say it doesn't start with what you're going to do. It starts with surrender. Now, when I say surrender, okay, what are some of the cultural connotations that you make? You know, surrender, surrender, right? What, what is surrender? It's, it's not complicated. It, it means to let go, give up. So here's one of the more underrated aspects of following Jesus. For those who are currently following Jesus or considering following Jesus, it's this, it's, it's, it's letting go. It's giving up. Some of you feel like giving up and you think that's a posture of weakness when in fact, it might be a posture of regeneration in your life. God might be doing something brand new. Are you ready to give up? you might be in the most powerful position and posture you've ever been in. Are you exhausted? Are you fatigued? Are you confused? Are you agitated? Are you frustrated? Are you mad at yourself, mad at your neighbors, mad at your parents, mad at your preacher, mad at your podcast manager? Are you just agitated? Are you frustrated? Has the NFL season started and your team is 0-3? You know what I say? Give up. Well, you know, Judah, I just, you know, remember we're in a cafe, we're having coffee. Judah, I just feel like giving up. You should. I'm sorry, pastor. I thought we were going to have an encouraging coffee together. Come again. You should definitely give up. Jesus says, and I quote, 
Anyone who wants to follow me should deny themselves. Let's stop right there. First thing he says. Deny yourself. Now here's what really gets me going and agitates me and frustrates me is we take these invaluable statements and phrases by Jesus and we assume upon the text what we think this means. And let me, let me break it down even more simpler. There is a nobility. If I hit this chair one more time. There, oh no, I didn't mean to do that. Uh-oh, the anger's coming out on stage. All right. Imagine me and my puppy. We assume there's a nobility in, um, uh, how should I say, uh, self-denial in our culture, right? Um, I, I tell people I don't drink alcohol, right? I stopped drinking alcohol like three years ago and uh, because I like things and I like them a lot and I get really into them. I think you get the picture. All right, so I, <laughs> is he, shut up. So, but you should see people when I tell them I don't drink. Their posture is almost affected like, oh, he's a man of God. <laughs> it happens all the time. People are almost proud of me while they're just guzzling the Heineken. They're like, hey, he doesn't drink. Because they, you want like, you, 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 and, and because there's, it, it's, it's not supernatural, it's not spiritual, it's normal and natural. And the normal natural thing is people who say no to stuff that other people all say yes to, that makes them better and different and cool and holy. And so I don't trust a preacher who drinks. So I just want you, so just tell all your friends, our preacher doesn't drink. Yeah, so I bet yours does. <laughs> and that's how we apply deny yourself. Deny yourself, which means say no to all the fun stuff. Why? Because you're a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me it ain't true. Some of you grew up in church long enough to know what I'm talking about. This has been applied to deny everything fun. And certainly anything from secular culture is not from God. Some of you are gonna, you're gonna find this wild because we're on the West Coast, but there are churches you still can't chew gum in. Can't wear hats in. Deny yourself. Right, and, and I, I, I think it's adorable and cute at best, but it's not the right treatment of what Jesus is saying. The denying of yourself means, would you stop acting like you can save yourself and have the power to change yourself and transform yourself and just make yourself better? You need to stop acting like you are the savior of yourself. Deny yourself. Tell yourself, stop playing savior for yourself. Yeah, I'm just kind of really on it right now, Judah. Man, I tell you what, I am focused. I am just, I am, I'm, I'm starting brand new. I made some dedications, some determinations. Now, it ain't long from now, New Year's resolutions are going to happen. I think they're fine, but let's call them what they are. It's people wanting to change and by their own sheer willpower, they're gonna attempt to do it. Now, here's the reality of it. We've talked about this before. There are some of us in this room who have better willpower than others and it's got nothing to do with your nobility or morality. It's just, that's the way you're wired. Okay, I am an all or nothing guy. I stopped drinking. The moment I said I'm not drinking anymore, I haven't drank since because I'm, I'm part of me is probably not very well. Okay, and when I start something, stop something, like it's no in between. I like smart sweets. You wouldn't believe the obsession I have with smart sweets. The inordinate amount of soluble fiber that is in this body right now is shocking. I'm telling you, an article was pushed to me on my phone the other morning, true story, I'm in the bath, and it says, a poor man's Ozempic, and it's soluble fiber. And I literally lifted my hands up and said, there is a God, because that smart sweets are full of soluble fiber. God's good but I eat too much. My friends tell me, oh, that's not good. You shouldn't eat so much. And so then I just don't do it in front of them. That's what I do. So the church has turned into a denial contest. Who's going to deny themselves? And yet we miss the forest for the trees. This is not about who doesn't drink or who doesn't eat candy. This is about who has given up. Jesus says you should give up because you can't save yourself. You can't even find directions, let alone save yourself. You can't find a Starbucks and there's one on every other corner. Save yourself? 
No, so when are we going to give up? If I was sitting at a coffee shop and not throwing chairs around, I would say, how do you feel? I just feel exhausted. I just don't know if I can do it. And I've tried so hard and I've really wanted to be a religious person. And it's just, you know, I've come and heard you preach at Savant a few times. You're really good. You know, that's what you would say. And I'd say, well, thank you. And, 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 you know, we'd just be talking and I just, I don't know, I'm exhausted. How exhausted? I, I mean, honestly, I think about giving up all the time. And I say, what do you mean? Well, just, I don't, just, I just admitting that I'm just, it's not going to work for me. I would say that's exactly the ticket. Give up. Deny yourself. Admit you can't do it. Now, here's the caveat with surrender. We think surrender is a salvation trait. Now, some of you are following my language. What I mean is we think surrender is this one-time thing you do to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But in reality, at the beginning of every day, you should give up. And then if you need to later, you should give up again. And then in the afternoon and evening, give up again. And then right before you go to bed, give up all over again. And use giving up for the rest of your spiritual journey. I have come to the end of myself. Perfect. That was the objective of all the teachings of Jesus. That's why all of them are impossible. You ever notice that? All of his teachings are impossible. You use people sleeping around. I say, if you've even thought about sleeping with someone you're not married to, you are an adulterer. Everyone's like, well, that's pretty much all of us. Every day, right? How do I do this? You give up, you give up, you give up. If anyone desires to come after me, he must deny himself. Here's what I'm raging against tonight and for the rest of my life. That is propagating in institutions and gatherings such as this, that there is this elite moral group of people that are exclusively Christian and because they vote right, chew right, drink right, smoke right, walk right, dress right, they're gonna get in the old pearly gates, but the rest of the world is screwed. And so we, excuse me, so we gather in our massive facilities and listen to our favorite preachers and pretend that we got a corner on the market. You do not. You are broken, and I am broken. Now, there are some people in this room, this is good news. You're like, dude, this is sick. I love this. Oh my God, okay, I'm in. And some of you don't like it because this sermon will not make your flesh feel good. I refuse. The sermons that I'm committed to preach for the rest of my career, which I think I got 15 years left, I think I can do it. Okay, so sometimes you guys are mean, but I don't want to get into those details, okay? I'm going to keep being, I'm going to keep, I love you too, thank you. But I'm going to to, to keep keep preaching, but I am committed to, to preach sermons that don't promote the work of your own self effort, but promote the supernatural sovereign involvement of God. I need God. And you do too. So what are we going to do? Are we going to keep telling people, you got to read the Bible? You are not going to have a relationship with God if you don't read your Bible. Guys, I love you. There are people that don't have a Bible and won't read the Bible and can't read the Bible. They can have a relationship with God. I love my Bible. I read my Bible as much as you do. Probably more. I don't want to brag. It's kind of what I do. I like it a lot. I'm really into the story. It really moves me. But, but when this became about whoever reads the most, whoever prays the most, that's not our message. Our message is, are you weak? Are you broken? Are you exhausted? Are you fatigued? Are you angry? Are you frustrated? Are you disoriented? Do you feel confused? Do you feel lost? Do you feel like giving up? Yeah, bro. Great. Do that. And ask God to fill the void. Hey, I can't do this. I know. I know. Surrender. The second thing I would tell you at this coffee shop is you need to commit, number one, to surrendering. And I would think that's a daily practice. I give up every day. I give up every day. I give up every day. And so should you, I think. Second one is I would urge you to sit with Jesus, to sit with him. 
to sit with him. To sit with him. Not to stand with him. Not to walk with him. But to sit with him. In fact, I'd like to propose to you that the very first posture of someone who has decided to believe in Jesus is the posture of sitting. And by the way, all of these three elements that I'm going to share with you, they work in tandem. When you give up, you get to sit down. All right. I'm exhausted. Take a seat. Take a seat. All right. What am I doing? Nothing. That's exactly the idea. Nothing. I think preaching the gospel should lead us to this point. If I'm not supposed to do anything, then what's going to happen? All good preaching should lead you to question this. Okay? For instance, all good preaching should lead you to this question. So can I just keep sinning and so God's okay with it? That's good preaching. You should question that in your mind when you hear me preach. Only listen to preachers that make you think, well, should I just keep sinning then? I guess sin's like already taken care of because that is exactly what happened when Paul preached. His audience was like, I guess sin's not a big deal. Oh, it's such a big deal. God crushed his son, Jesus, with all the air, selfish sin and acts of humanity. But I assure you, you are no longer defined by sin for all who believe in Jesus are defined by his gifted righteousness. And now you are clothed with his perfection and you are perfect and right before God. Church is not a place where we are to dissect sin. It is a place where we investigate and adore the one who has set us free free from sin. Yeah. Following Jesus all over again. How do I start following Jesus all over again? I want you to give up. Now, I didn't get into the practical elements of giving up, but can I just say my favorite and most practical way at the risk of something like I'm giving you something to do? I would just say it out loud so you can hear yourself. I give up! That's the best practical advice I can give you. I give up. I don't know. Get lipstick out and write it on your mirror. I officially give up. Sign a contract with yourself. I hereby declare Judah Smith gives up. I cannot save myself. In fact, the more I try to save myself, the worse it gets. I am done trying to save myself, improve myself, and better myself. I'm at the end of myself, and I quit. Signed, sincerely, Reverend Judah Smith. I added the reverend. That was a little little too much. So I want you to give up and then I want you to sit. So there's this scene, right? Some of you know this, one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. There's this scene where Mary and Martha, two of the closest humans to Jesus in his earthly ministry, other than his 12 disciples, they got a little brother named Lazarus. He's got a crazy story. But Mary and Martha are in their house and Jesus is over and he's crisscross applesauce with Mary in the living room and Martha's in the kitchen and she's cooking up a meal for Jesus as she should. It's like host the man of God, you know, host the, the, the son of the living God. And Martha complains as she should, because she's clearly a citizen of the United States of America. She's complaining in the kitchen because Mary isn't helping her. Be careful, Christians. As you complain about seekers who aren't doing enough for God, you might get the same response from God. He goes, nah, nah, I'm not going to tell her that, Martha. In fact, Mary is doing, is doing the one thing that is necessary. Is doing? I don't think Mary's doing anything, guys. Go back to the story. You can find it in the Gospel of John. Mary is sitting there silently listening to Jesus. She's not doing anything. She's receiving. She's hearing. I guess that's somewhat doing, but she's like, this is the one thing that is necessary. What is Mary doing? She is sitting, letting Jesus love her. I'm going to ask you a very pointed question. Forgive me for a moment. I'm going to ask all those who have been following Jesus. When is the last time, think about it, give me a second, that you let Jesus love you? Because if it's been a while, you're missing the one thing he necessitates. Because in this country and the way we are programmed, we are programmed to do things for Jesus. And you know where this all starts? Jesus wants to start by doing things for you. Yeah. 
Now, in a moment, the band's going to come and we're going to sing, right? We're going to sing, Jesus, we love you. You're the best. You're the biggest. You're the brightest. You're amazing. I love you. You're always there. You're my shepherd. You're my king. You're the man. You're the one, right? And he thinks that's adorable. But when did, I mean, I wrote a song there for the record, but when, when's the last time, I'm being so serious, man, that you let him love you? I want to use some of my practices as an example, but I want to be very clear as I do this. It's not nearly as sensational as it sounds. Every morning I take a bath with Epsom salt. Welcome to my life. Today I took two Epsom salt baths because I had shooting pain down my right leg. And I wondered, huh, I haven't been that active. <laughs> I must have slept wrong, right? I mean, it's just weird at this age, okay? So a lot of Epsom salt baths over here, okay? pumping through the salt, okay? So much salt in my bath. And when I do that, I practice every morning by starting my day with giving up and letting God love me. Now, my personality is what I am, okay? Christians won't tell you this. Jesus followers won't tell you this, but we all have our moments with God based on our personality, if we're honest, okay? Some of you journal because journaling fits how you flow. Okay, I don't journal. That sounds stressful, painful, challenging, unnerving. I write books sometimes and that's hard too. And I don't like doing that, right? So why would I journal? Ugh, I don't want to do that. So, but what I do like to do in my personality is use my imagination. I always picture Jesus. His form can change sometime to me what he looks like. And I will sit there and I will let him speak to me. I'll let him reassure me. And I don't know if it's always him sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, dude, he is really complimenting me today. It's like, is it me? Is it him? I don't know, but this is awesome. But our tradition now in this country and what we teach people, and I say this country because I'm more uh, uh, aware of what happens here. I've grown up in the church my whole life in this country. We tell people what to do, but we never tell them to let God love them. We don't even teach people that. God, I just thank you for this day. I just want to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, I just pray right now for my mom. Pray for my grandma. Pray for my son. Pray for my daughters. Pray for my friends. Pray for my neighbors. Pray for, oh God, I pray for my team. Pray for my... And we'll get through the list. We'll get through the list. When's the last time you just let him love you? Just listen. I got a crazy story. This is going to blow you away. I think it's in Luke chapter eight. Hey guys, at first I didn't know what everyone was looking at. I was like, what is going on? Oh, it's the boy band. Here we go. I like it. You guys look great tonight, man. Um, Jesus sets this one guy free of all these demons. And I don't know why this story moves me so deeply today. I'd never seen it like this before. And it says, that people came out of the local village because they heard, you know, the crazy guy. And I know that's a crude way to say it, but that's what they would have said. You know, the guy, that guy. The, Jesus said he's healed. What? Come on, bro, come on. He's just outside the village. And the Bible says, Luke chapter 8, they came out to see the man who was unhinged and unwell. And, and there he was. And Luke says... He was seated in front of Jesus at his feet, clothed and in his right mind. Isn't that interesting? The first thing that happens after this man gets set free from demonic oppression and possession is he is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, some of you, I, I, I see some of you and you've been coming a long, long time. Met a guy yesterday in Playa Vista. He said, man, I've been coming since you were up in the small ballroom at Montage. I was like, that's a long time ago. So by now, you probably figured out like, you know, to be honest, bro, like, yeah, Judas is a good guy. He's a good communicator. It's pretty much the same sermon every month. We don't do well sitting, standing. Walking, talking, doing, worshiping, praying, sitting at the feet of Jesus. 
I know this might sound strange, but I think it's my assignment tonight to tell somebody in this room that your healing happens at his feet, not on your feet, at his feet. Give up and sit with him. And lastly, I believe there is surrendering, there is sitting. This is how we start to follow Jesus all over again. And my last point, and I am coming to a close at some point within the next hour. (laughs) Stepping. Here's the action for you doers, for you type A driven human beings who are incredible. Give up, sit down, and just take the next step. Now, this gets difficult. Let me explain. And I promise we're close to coming to a close. Preachers like me do something, and I'll pick on my kind, so bear with me. We do stuff like this. In 2004, I had a struggle, I had a problem. I did, and, and God met me in 2004. Church, I want to tell you about it. And preachers like me divulge into extensive detail on how 14, 15, 18, 20 years ago, God set us free from something. Now, you may not feel this way, but many people do because I sit where you sit. I'm not just a preacher. I'm also a consumer of preaching and teaching and communication. And over the years, I've heard so many great orators and communicators, and they've come through my dad's church, which is now this church. And for those that don't know, today marks our 31st year of existence as a church. 31 years today. 31. That was Anthony Hardaway's jersey when he played at Memphis. But anyways, always equated to some great athlete. 31. It's our Penny Hardaway year. All right, guys, it's just something that I do. All right. So I'm like, that's distracting. That's not from the Bible. So what we do is we tell you these things that God healed and fixed us from. And here's how it's received often. You go, oh, I, I still struggle with that. Dang. Oh, I still have a problem with that. All right, I got to make a plan <laughs> to stop doing that. I got to make a plan. And what you, what you may not even know that we are so busy doing, even subconsciously in our culture, is we start planning for tomorrow. We start attempting to live even emotionally a week from now, two weeks from now. We start planning and and, 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 and scheduling. Listen, I'm going to try to say this the most caring way. Scheduling and planning is a practicality of life, and I understand it's a practice of highly effective people. Thank you, Stephen Covey. I get it. Okay? I'm fine with it. I think we should question how scheduled we are. I'm I'm being serious. I'm being serious. Today is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The problem is a lot of us are not rejoicing and being glad because we're not in it. It's Wednesday, but we already been in Friday for hours. We're in meetings we haven't had. We're holding conversations we haven't had, but we're going to have. We enduring the day. Come on, it's like it's the same stuff you used to do with Christmas if you were like me. Counting down them days to December 25th. Just trying to get through the day. Remember when school was about to get out and summer was imminent and you had like two weeks left of school and you were like, I don't even care about these days. These are throwaway days. These are wasteful days. These are get through the days. These are not like thrive days. These are endure days. These are just get through the day. And yet we have forgotten what God can do in one day. One day. Can a nation be born in a day? The scripture says the prophet prophesies. Do you know why? He is simply imploring the recipient to consider with your imagination the capability and capacity of the divine and what he can do in one day. But all of our planning centers and Googles and all of our, we, they teach us just, you can get, just get, yep, yep. And it's not about the day. It's about the accomplishment, the deed, the thing we've done.
there's a there's a prophecy in the Bible that says that all of our all of our good deeds and accomplishments are like filthy rags to God. Did you know and did I know, and I forget this all the time, maybe you have too, that God made you not for the career you're going to have, but he made you for himself almost exclusively. He loves what you do. He thinks you're an incredible artist, you're an incredible leader, you're an incredible barista, you're an incredible dad, you're an incredible mom, you're a great friend, you're a wonderful neighbor. He thinks you're amazing. But we have started to gather in churches like this and I have become the person that helps you fulfill your career and fulfill your goals and get to your, and, and the whole time, there's a God who calls himself Father. And what he wants more than anything is not you making the stock market this incredible source. Enjoy the stock market. I got nothing against it. But life isn't about the stock market. It's not about your finances. It's not about, brothers and sisters, I love you so much and I shouldn't talk so candidly, but I am telling you, it is not about my preaching. But I, I had so many years, I was like, God, I am going to be your mouthpiece. I'm going to be your prophet. And I thought to myself, God must be blessed to have me on his team. <laughs> he, he just wants to connect with me. And I have figured out that when I walk on this stage, he loves you and I'm to serve you. But you have to know, as it pertains to me, even this activity one of its essence, one of the goals of this activity for me is that I connect with the one who made me. And when I walk off this stage every month, I used to do it every week, but I got tired. So every month, him and I have a moment. Every time, I'm like, man, that was wild. That was wild. I know. You did it again, man. You filled my mouth. You gave me examples. You gave me things to say. Thank you. Thank you, son. Let's do this more. I thought my career, by the time I got to heaven, God and all of his angels would stand and say, you know, he was one of the top listened to preachers in America. I think we are obsessed with our plans and God's focused on our steps. Do you remember the story? The psalmist says, he is a lamp unto my feet. Look it up. The lamp spoken of by the psalmist is a dimly lit candle lamp that only would light the path enough for you to see the next step. And I just wonder sometimes if we are projecting into places and spaces and chapters and seasons that God did not intend. I wonder if technology is telling us things that aren't necessarily true, that might be true, and we are all anxious and fearful. Not over today, but over tomorrow. Do you know the scripture never says tomorrow is the day the Lord is made? It doesn't say that. God was so determined. I promise I'm coming to a close. We're not even at an hour yet. I'm coming to a close. God was so determined to instill this into his people that he taught the children of Israel to eat bread, but they got fresh bread every day. And if they saved it for the next day, listen to me, the bread would mold and rot and worms would be in it. God, a little heavy handed. It is just bread. Worms, rot, moat. That's right. Just today. Just today. I want you to trust me in the next step. 
And one of the reasons people in this room need to start over again is because one of the reboots that's happening in your life is instead of trying to figure out the next decade of your life, oh child, have mercy, how tired you must be. For who can predict the future? Who knows what tomorrow will bring? Jesus says in one of his monumental moments in messaging, he says, isn't today enough trouble? Isn't there enough for today? For tomorrow will take care of itself. Live today. We think only our yoga instructor teaches us to be present when in fact the son of the living God taught this. Just take, just take, just take one more step. Just take one more step. And here's what I've learned. This is a leveler. I am so exhausted and fatigued with the moral high ground that has been propagated by well-meaning preachers and institutions just like this church. It is not serving us. People are exhausted in their fatigue and they see Christians as some upper echelon elitists who don't understand the real man. And I'm here to level the playing field. This life is not about who can plan the most and who can populate their checkings and savings with the most money. It's about a relationship with the divine, the God who wants to meet you now, today, tonight, here, and show you just your next step. But oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Don't tell anybody that you're just taking the next step because that's not the way our culture is oriented. That won't impress nobody. In fact, I'll tell you what impresses people. I got my next 10 years planned out. People are like, whoa, can I do coffee with you? Teach me how to plan that. I wanna wanna do that. You got, man, you got all these decades decided and everything. And and, um, Jesus says, you must deny yourself. Is it just me or is my planning indication of my attempt again to save myself? For if I plan and prepare, isn't preparation the key to execution? Because that's what all of our athletes tell us. As if life is a game and the people who win are those who plan the most and save the most money. Says who? God? What if the way you get ahead in life is give your money away? What if it's exactly the opposite of what we thought? What if your planning is causing you pain and you don't even know it? What if the illusion of control and predictable outcome is haunting you and you don't even recognize it? I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna. Abraham, the father of our faith, God says you give your cousin the choice of the land because, woof, man, I feel this, because I don't care what land you get because I'm gonna bless you. And I don't want anyone to be able to say, I made you. It was me. Everyone I've met, you know, that has experienced um, God using them in a way that's impacted more people than they could have ever imagined. Behind the closed doors, they all tell me, I don't really know how this happened. I don't know but we persist, you know, in our technology and information age and we write books to try to train people how to get the same outcome and we eat it up like cheesecake at the Cheesecake Factory. That is the happiest you've ever been in this church and I respect that. Fresh strawberry cheesecake at the Cheesecake Factory. Get out of the town. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I needed that. Thank you. And like, am I, sometimes I do think I'm crazy, but what if you threw the plan out? I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm being so serious, man. What if you threw the plan out? Try to plan your kids. What? Try to plan your marriage. 
Brothers and sisters, have we not learned? I was in a meeting today about our podcast because we're going to do more podcasts because that's what I need. I need to talk more. But we're going to do the podcast. And out of nowhere, I start getting this pain down my right leg like I told you about. And I got to be honest with you. If that pain kept going, I'm like, I, I won't be able to function. I do not have a high pain tolerance because I'm honest. Just like that, just a little pain in your body and your whole life can change. We're going to sit in here with all the access we have to the understanding of who God is and tell ourselves that whoever plans best wins. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. That word ordered means I will make your next step firm. I'm going to end with this. Let me give you what I, right now currently as I stand here is the most accurate description of the supernatural life of following Jesus. Are you ready? Here it is. The best example I can give you in all the New Testament is this moment when Jesus walked on the water. Water was a metaphor in antiquity and ancient culture for the chaos of life and the universe and powers known and unknown. The waters and the turbulent upheaval of the oceans and the waves and the seas and its mysterious depths under the Leviathan. It was all metaphor in the ancient world of the upheaval and unpredictability of the human existence and the powers seen and unseen in the fourth dimension, third dimension. And the Bible says that Jesus walked on the water in the middle of a storm, which is to say he walks on all the elements of this realm. And nothing has his worried or frazzled or concerned. He sits in the heavens and he laughs at his enemies. And Peter said, Peter said, if that's you, call me on the water. This is conversion. This is Christianity. It's not what you think, man. God, we've domesticated this. We've turned it into a Sunday church attendance and a Bible reading plan and a prayer card. If this isn't supernatural, please, let's go home. Get somebody else to motivate you. There's better communicators than me. Walk on some hot coals, pump yourself up, do it. But are we not here under the premise? that perhaps there's a creator and a God who's in charge and he walks over the upheaval of this broken universe and solar system. And Peter says, if that's you, would you call me out on the water? And Jesus says, come on. Peter starts walking on the calamity of the universe. Do you understand what I'm saying? He starts walking on stuff that by ourselves we sink in. Is that what we're gonna do? We gonna come to church and pretend like we don't sink like other people? Because you're so sinkable and so am I. But the Bible says, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, not his voting record, not his Bible reading plan, but Jesus, he walked where others sunk. And I am here to tell you, every step Peter took had his attention. Every step. <laughs> he just kept walking towards Jesus. When did he sink? When he started, come on, Jesus worshipers. Are we going to spend the rest of our days sinking and sunk up under the same thing everybody else is? Or are we going to put God to the test and say, okay, I'm sinking 
I'm soaked, but I'm surrendered. And you got to help me walk on this because if you don't, I'm cooked, man. And the Bible says when he sunk in the water, I wish I had more time. That's why Chelsea told me to get to the sermon quicker. But Jesus immediately grabs Peter and he lifts him up. Don't you get it? This is the whole Christian life. This is the whole gospel. You were called to walk on water. Do you hear what I'm telling you? That's right. God wants to do for you in that area of failure and brokenness. He wants you to start walking on water in that area. And when people come and ask you, don't you dare tell them the seven non-negotiables for water walkers. Don't you do it. Don't you do it, Americans. You tell the truth. I don't exactly know. How long you've been married? 23 years. How'd you do it? I don't really know. Ask Chelsea. <laughs> How are you raising teenagers in LA? I don't really know. Ask Chelsea. <laughs> I'm looking for some people who want to be honest that either this is supernatural or we're all doomed, you hear me? Either there is a water walker, a God man and a creator, that even when you sink, he's there to pull you up and get you back living this supernatural life. Let's start following Jesus all over again. Let's get honest, let's get transparent, let's get broken. We can start again tonight. You hear me tonight? Tonight is the night the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Tonight is the night the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's be here. Let's be right now. Let's be present, and let's, God, let's ask God to help us walk on some stuff that we've been sinking in. Are you sinking in grief? Are you sinking in loss? Are you sinking in pain? Are you sinking in lying or cheating or stealing? Where are you sinking? Where are you sinking? There's a God who can pull you out of that and get you back up in that supernatural life called following Jesus. I believe with every ounce of my being. Come on, come on. Close your eyes just for a moment, just for a moment, just for a moment, just for a moment. Oh, God is talking to some people tonight. Woo! It's time to start over again. It's time to reboot again. I'm talking to you. New beginnings. And the Bible says in Isaiah 43, with your eyes closed, behold, I am doing a new thing. And now it springs forth. Do you not see it? I will make a way in the wilderness and I will make a river in the desert. Behold, I am doing a new thing thing. That is the word I got from God for you. God is doing a new thing. The grass has withered and the flower has faded, but the grass is budding again. The flowers are blooming again. There is a new chapter and a new day and a new season and a new era that you are about to walk into. And you have experienced some sinking and you've experienced some submerging and you have been overwhelmed in your soul and your brain. But there is a God and his arm is not too short. He is mighty to save and he's going to pull you up out of what you've been sinking in and he's going to get you back up on the supernatural life of walking where others sink. What God has started, he will finish. What God has started, he will finish. It is not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. If you're here tonight and you would like to receive the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus offers, that only Jesus presents, for he knew, knew no sin became sin, so that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you would like to receive the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus offers, for it is the performance of Jesus, it is the work of Jesus, it is the righteousness of Jesus that affords you and me the free gift of right relationship with God. It is not by our doing. 
It is not by our mental capacity. It is not by understanding or ascertaining. It is by his son. If you believe in his son and you believe that he is the savior of the world and you would like to receive him on the count of three all over this auditorium or anyone watching, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to shoot up your hand and put it right back down. You know who you are. One, two, three. If that's you, shoot your hand up all over this room. I receive, I believe and I receive. Oh God, you see these hands. But more importantly, you see these hearts. And I thank you that we are forgiven forever. Totally and completely forgiven. Jesus. You'll never be the same. Secondly, and I, I've got to do this tonight. If you're here and you say, Judah, I am believing that there is a new chapter and a new era and a new season for me. I have felt like I'm sinking and I'm overwhelmed and I'm scared and I need to start following Jesus all over again. If that's you, would you raise your hand all over this auditorium and say, that's me. That's me. God, you see your sons and you see your daughters. You see your children. Here we sit admitting that we cannot save ourselves. God, meet us here and meet us now. Oh, great God of all earth, the God, the lightning maker, the thunder creator, the ocean designer. You're here. Meet us here, wonderful God. And birth new. Start new. I declare newness and freshness over your life in Jesus' name.